This is the Mend It Pass podcast with Chadwick Hayward, episode 21. Welcome to MendItPass.com. Let's get back to bed now. Hi, Path Menders. Thanks for tuning in. This week, I'm honored to speak with Dr. Howard Jacobson, PhD. Howard has a Master's of Public Health and a Doctorate of Health Studies from Temple University, as well as a BA in History from Princeton. He is a contributing author on Whole, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition, as well as The Low-Carb Fraud, both by Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Ph.D. He also co-authored Proteinaholic, How Our Obsession with Meat is Killing Us and What We Can Do About It, with Dr. Garth Davis, M.D. He's also written three editions of AdWords for Dummies. In addition to being a researcher and author, Howard is a speaker, educator, and coach. He currently runs the Big Change program, along with fellow Path Mender and previous guest Josh Lajani. He also hosts the most excellent Plant Yourself podcast. If you want to take advantage of his personal coaching, you can email him directly at hj at plantyourself.com. Hi, Howard. Thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure. A pleasure. Looking forward to it. It's great to have you on the show. I know you have a lot of education in health. You have a master's of public health as well as a PhD in health studies, Um, but that didn't necessarily translate into leading a healthy life yourself initially. Um, So do you want to take us back maybe about 15 years or so and tell us a little bit what your life was like then? Hmm. So let's, well, so 15, 20 years, so (laughs) So there was a lot of stuff that I knew and I forgot. A, a lot of the forgetting was when we started a family and I became a father. And just, you know, anything that worked in the moment, it was like life was this, this giant conspiracy of seduction. Like whatever would make her stop crying in that moment was fine. It was perfect. <laughs> so... You know, so the the foods that we're eating, the the TV or the videos we were watching, it, it all just felt like like playing catch up, and you know, going for you know years and years of sleep deprived. And I think a lot of parents might recognize this um, because we weren't living particularly healthy lives to begin with. There was kind of a compounding effect and just sort of a race to the bottom. So, at, you know, at my at my heaviest, I was probably 35, 40 pounds overweight. Um, what I thought of as health was actually sort of like, you know, alternative medicine, like holistic treatments that were still treating symptoms and, you know, not addressing the root causes, which was, you know, diet and lifestyle. Yeah. So, you know, all, all these are... Um, I guess you'd, you know, you'd call that they're like positives, things you'd add to your life. And I didn't need any of those things added to my life. I just needed things taken away. Okay. And so um, that's, that's kind of where, where, where I was, sort of, uh, you know, inexcusably ignorant considering my education and overweight, exhausted, eating crappy food, and, and pretty damn cranky. And you get into a cycle where you're you're just reacting as opposed to being proactive about things. Right. Yeah. So things kind of changed for you when you um, read the China study. Yeah, that was that was the that was the second big one. Um, as I said, you know, I'd for, you know, my first big one was in 1990. I read John Robbins' Diet for a New America. And that, that kind of stuck with me for about four or five years before I completely forgot <laughs> that it existed. Um, but I guess, you know, the seed had been planted. And so, you know, I, I felt like, you know, one of these like, smokers trying to quit. And, uh, you know, every time you, you quit for a couple of months, it actually makes it more likely that you'll succeed, succeed the next time. So John Robbins definitely tenderized me <laughs> to the point where when I encountered the China study, I was I was ready for it. Because I think a lot, you know, a lot of people, if they read the book, uh, the China study openly with 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 curiosity, they would be convinced, but, you know, most of us are, are really, um, we're, we're stuck with our identities and anything that, that, that challenges those identities, we're, we're very likely to, to reject out of hand. So luckily I had an experience where I had already had some sort of conversion. So I was open to 
the arguments in the China study that I just found just incontrovertible. Yeah, so you were the soil was already tilled, so to speak, and the China study just planted the the seeds to grow. Yeah. Oh, good metaphor. <laughs> so, wh- what what changed? Um, you you read the book. Did you go home and empty your cupboards, or like how did it impact your life in a more practical sense? Yeah. So I, you know, immediately changed my diet to eliminate all animal products. Um, I didn't necessarily get the whole food bit for a while. So there was still, you know, oil and white flour and things, but, but simply, you know, eliminating the animal foods, okay. the cheese, the dairy, um, some, some meat, but not a ton. Um, but that, that's, that's how I started. And the other thing I did was I came home and now instead of like looking at packages uh, in my fridge or in the cupboard, I just saw like that skull and crossbones like poison. <laughs> and so I became very difficult to live with because, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't give people a chance to catch up. I didn't give them the China study. You know, at, at that point it was 2000, late 2004, early 2005. Um, you know, my, my daughter was nine, my son was five and a half. And, you know, they, they had their own ideas and they had their own preferences. And I had been, of course, enabling and indulging those preferences for years. And, you know, my wife also had her food preferences. So I, I turned into a, a, a very un- unpleasant person, <laughs> shall we say. Um, and I caused a lot of of emotional upheaval and I think some damage in, in my, in my crusade. I felt responsible for them as I always had. Mm. And now it just, to me, it looked like they were just like, you know, tipping bottles of Drano into their mouth. And all I wanted to do was like knock them out of their hands before they killed themselves. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a little bit ugly. And a couple of years ago, my daughter um, who's now 21, she and I did a, a presentation together basically a how-to guide for parents and using almost everything I did as a cautionary tale. (sighs) Oh dear. So how long, like, obviously there was resistance from your family that I assume they eventually shared in your whole food plant-based lifestyle, but that wasn't right away. It wasn't right away. And it wasn't, even when it was, it wasn't continuous. You know, I think I, I planted the seeds of a fair amount of rebellion. Okay. So, you know, they, cert- they certainly eat a lot better than most other people their age. Um, I think there's a, to a certain extent, they, they had to recover from me so that they could um, experience their food for themselves. And recognize that certain foods, while they tasted good, weren't giving them the energy they wanted or the complexion they wanted or the physique they wanted. And, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, I did more harm than good by introducing so much noise hmm. into the equation that it's taken them a long time to really be able to listen for the signal and to, to eat according to their own body's wisdom rather than you know, this is what daddy says. Yeah. Well, I guess that being said, then if you could go back and do it over, what would you change? Um, well, for, you know, one thing I would change is to remember that I had been in my forties and I had eaten crap most of my life and I was still okay. Yeah. Like there, there wasn't an emergency here. There was no, you know, in my mind, it was an emergency. It was like, you know, knocking drain cleaner out of their hands because they were going to die immediately. And obviously they weren't. And so I would I would certainly have engaged with them in more conversation. I probably would have used the, you know, animals are cute and adorable angle (laughs) a little bit more. Um. And I think I, w- I would have talked to them more about, and this is, I think, complicated, but, but about what it means to be different from other people hmm. and, and how, how to do that, why it's important to not go along with the cultural mainstream w- in certain circumstances, and how to do it in ways that don't alienate others. 
because I found one, 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 one thing that happened when my kids came around is they turned into sort of little, you know, totalitarian dictator copies of me. And I remember getting a call from a neighbor quite incensed that my daughter had uh, had wondered to his daughter why her parents hated her so much that they wanted her to have cancer because they were giving her milk. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's, I, I, th- I just would have been slower, more respectful, more educational. I, I just would have been less in emergency mode. I think the whole thing took place on sort of high fight or flight on my part, and it just spread contagiously. Okay. I I would say my change has been similar <laughs> in that <laughs> mine was a light switch. And then it's like, you, looking back, you're like, how did I ever live that way? <laughs> but, are, are you uh, in, in a situation where there's other people you're, you're, you're sharing your food? No, my wife is, um, my wife is on board with me as well. Now she's, she's probably more the nutritarian approach where give, give herself the 10%. Um, at, at least in the past, less so, less so more recently, but, um, I've, I've been, I'm more of the hardcore make a rule and, and it needs to, it's either for the rule or against the rule. So I'm pretty, pretty, um, pretty compliant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I guess what advice would you give for someone? Cause you touched on it there. It is hard to go against the grain to essentially feel like you're swimming upstream in a culture that is going in the absolute opposite direction of you. Um, I guess what would be your advice for someone for being okay with themselves in that situation or uh, making it easier to relate with other people? Yeah. So let's, let's take the family out of it for a little bit okay, and, and just talk about, you know, so an individual who is, coming around to realize that everyone around them is, is basically slowly poisoning themselves with crap yeah. and that they want to do something differently. So there's, there's, there's a couple of, of biological imperatives at play here. One, one of them is, you know, we're eating very unnatural foods. And so we're having very unnatural human reactions to them in terms of weight gain and, and various chronic conditions. That's counterbalanced, though, by there's the other very unnatural thing for humans to do biologically is to not conform to the group, especially around something that has traditionally been as sacred as eating. You know, eating is kind of understood as, you know, a, a communal act in which we all assimilate the same qualities. And so we, you know, we share the, the fruits of our labor together. It really, it really is one of the most fundamental bonding aspects in, in human culture throughout, throughout history, throughout time and place. Yeah. And, and so to understand that when we take a stand at, at eating differently, we are basically threatening the, the entire structure of our society in our minds, in, you know, in their minds. And we're, and we're also in danger of, putting out signals of, of we reject them and we need to be ostracized for the good of the group. Hmm. So I think it's important not to underplay what happens because we, we, you know, we, we get all superior, right? Yeah. So we're walking, we're walking around like, Oh, well, I, I eat really well. And then we commiserate with, yeah, you know, I ordered at the, at the dinner, I, 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 Said no to the the, uh, the cheesecake, and I just asked for a bowl of strawberries and cherries and and raspberries, and I got all these funny looks, and people made comments, and we're 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 like we're so superior to those people who are making those snarky comments, but we're we're misinterpreting where it's coming from, you know. So that whole where do you get your protein thing? Yeah, it, it comes from a really deep human place. And I think if we don't acknowledge that, we are going to turn people off with our, you know, with our attitude, with our superiority and, and with our um, seeming self-sufficiency in the face of their criticism. Yeah. The self uh, self-perceived superiority in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, you know, it's hard. So we want something to cling to too. So we're, you know, so I was like, 
yeah, well, you all are going to you know, get a stroke or drop dead of a heart attack while I'm still running in my 90s. So there like yeah. that, that was that was the, the source code of my behavior, even though the words never came out. But, you know, people aren't stupid. They can they can read that. They perceive it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you like you're meeting a new couple now or, or someone in public? Um, how do you avoid giving that impression? Yeah. So I I have trained myself over many years to not care what other people are eating, which is it's it's hard for people who want to be activists. Hmm. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if, especially if you're in the animal rights or animal welfare wing of the plant based community, it's it's very hard to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've trained myself to do so. And I've trained myself to remember that I don't actually know if I'm right. <laughs> right. Like I think I'm right. I do the things that I do because they're in accordance with my values, my priorities, my goals, my ethics, but I could be wrong. And so just, just allowing that possibility that there's other ways of looking at the world and other ways of behaving that might be equally or, or more, ethical, moral, compassionate than mine gives, gives me a little bit of space, a little bit of breathing room. Okay. And the second thing I do is I, you know, I try to be just a good role model so that people would be interested in my opinions. I remember one, one Halloween, we were, uh, we were still living in New Jersey and, um, a neighbor from down the street came by um, oh, I remember, no, I remember what happened. My kids came home with, you know, their bags of, of candy and they also had pamphlets and the, the pamphlets were by this sort of fundamentalist family who, who thought Halloween was like the devil's holiday <laughs> and they were you know trying to get us all to not, to not do it. And this family were miserable. Like it was, you know, two kids, two parents, they just whenever they were out, they, they were angry at each other. They were unhappy. They looked unhealthy. The kids were just sort of depressed and downtrodden. And I remember thinking, like, why would anyone want to be like that? Yeah. Like, if they t- if they gave me a piece of advice, I would ipso facto do the other thing <laughs> just just so I wouldn't be as miserable as they were. And it, it became very clear to me that that's sort of generalizable, that if I want other people to care you know, what I'm up to, what I'm doing. I need to be someone, I think of it as the, uh, you know, that, that, that scene in when Harry met Sally in the restaurant, you know, I, I want what she's having. Yeah. Like I, I don't try to talk to people. I don't offer, I don't offer advice anymore. I don't begin conversations about food. And most of the time in public settings, I now deflect conversations about food by changing the subject. So I really want people to, you know, they find me through through the books I've helped to write. They find me through the podcast. They find me through referral. So I, I, I've changed. I, I kind of want to be a little bit of a secret rather than someone running around shouting through a bullhorn. <laughs> Pass on your information by simple osmosis as opposed to direct pushing. <laughs> yeah, much much more effective. <laughs> That's awesome. You had said that you're not sure if what you're doing is right. Um, based on my understanding, I think that your switch to a whole food plant-based lifestyle is really based on the health aspect as opposed to uh, the environmental or the animal welfare aspect. So if just to clarify for people, because I, I think the preponderance of evidence supports a whole food plant-based lifestyle, like what is the percentage of doubt in your mind? Like h- how much would you allocate to the chance of you being wrong. Right. Good question. Let, let me, I want to put a pin in that for a second and just say that you know, for me, the way I publicly express is all about health because I'm very interested in health and I know stuff about health and it's an easy thing for me to talk about. And I find it's a, it's the thing that, that people are most interested in when they're starting out. Yeah. Um, I do. I, I, I am very concerned about the environment and my, my role in, in either preserving it or, you know, messing it up for future generations. And I also think that almost every form of animal agriculture is just rude. Like I wouldn't, 
you know, I think as a species, we're quite, we're quite ill-mannered. Yeah. And I don't like to participate in that. So it's not simply that it's health. If someone suddenly told me that, uh, you know, eating large uh, quantities of McDonald's was, was actually proven good for me, I think there's still compelling reasons that for me not to do it. Okay. But to, to get back to your question about doubt, um, I would say I can't, I can't quantify it. And I don't think it's, for me, it doesn't need to be quantified. It's not like 10% doubt is somehow scarier than 0.001% doubt. <laughs> it's, it's the fact that there's any. Okay. And the fact that when I, when I see a, a new paper come out or a new argument or a new book, I'm actually looking not to debunk it, but I'm looking for where it's strong. Because I've seen this just too much in, in scientists and in academics that they become very unscientific as soon as they have a reputation to uphold. Hmm. As, as soon as their name, their fortune, their, their tenure, their status gets linked to an idea, they can become blind to counter evidence. Yeah, confirmation bias really becomes apparent. Yeah, confirmation bias. And, and so given that, I have, that I'm a human being and I have confirmation bias, I, I can try to mitigate it by really looking for, at smart people who say things that are different from me and, and really be curious about what do they know that I'm missing. Yeah, you should definitely pay more attention to ideas that are the opposite of what you expect and really be more skeptical about ideas that support any preconceived conclusion that you have. Right. Because one, one of the things I've discovered in my, in my research is that when people thought they were right in the past, <laughs> they never were. Yeah. <laughs> right. Science is the history of being wrong. Yeah. And so for me to think, Oh, we've got it figured out now, you know, now, th- now we understand the final word on human nutrition. Like it's so complicated. Yeah. You know, there's like, there's so many issues even like, I just don't know the answer to like, you know, sodium, for example, I, I am so confused based on really good analysis of really good studies. I can argue both that for most people adding sodium makes no difference. And in fact, reducing it too much is harmful and that any added sodium is bad for you. Yeah. I don't know. I've yeah. seen I've seen really good evidence that alcohol is a toxin, and yet most of the longest lived people in the world are pretty good drinkers. Yeah. Like I think there's stuff we don't know yet. I totally agree with that. There's well, I think they say that more than fifty percent of the total DNA in your body comes from bacteria. It's not actually yours, mm. and like our understanding of of that. Uh, bioflora is minuscule compared to the total amount of data that we could eventually have on it. So to, yeah, to assume that we know it all would be quite ignorant. Right. And even after working with Colin Campbell on whole, I started thinking that certain things are simply unknowable, Hmm. regardless of how much computing power and refinement of electron microscopy we throw at it. I think there are, cert- there are certain things about existence and even our own existence that are simply going to be mysteries. Are you able to pick an example? Well, even, even around nutrition, like understanding how our food turns into us and fuels our, our health. Like we know a little bit. We have, we have some broad strokes. But to think that we're going to be able to map out every single reaction so that we so that, so that it becomes predictable so that we can turn biology into physics yeah and and say well you know when such and such a person eats such and such an apple this is what happens and and, and the truth is the the body does it effortlessly yeah i i don't know if i agree with that cuz i i don't think it's any, we're anywhere close to that but i i kind of as long as we don't bring ourselves to extinction i think given our given a long enough time frame i think it's inevitable that we would we would know that but if it's knowable if it's knowable which if it's if it's the reaction of a biological process right it 
it all happens uh, based on physics and chemistry. Yeah, and, I don't and, think so. No, I, I think a lot of physics is 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 now the physics of emergent systems. I don't think like when I was a kid, I remember reading this book called The Mind's Eye, I, the, the letter I, like I is in me. Yeah, and there was a story in there called I think it was called like Einstein's Brain, and the the premise was that somebody had mapped out all the synapses and connections and neurons in Einstein's brain into a giant book. And you could therefore then have a conversation with it and it would respond as Einstein. Okay. Right? And I, I, I simply don't see evidence for, for that kind of determinism that, that a, a living organic system is going to be unpredictable because of free will, which, you know, if, if humans have free will, yeah. then I think uh, it's certainly plausible that, you know, that other forces in nature exert unpredictable will. Well, that, that question comes down to where, where does the line between biology and consciousness really, where is it? Right. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm of the, uh, the faction that thinks that consciousness is primary and matter is an epiphenomenon, a, a co-creation of consciousness, as opposed to consciousness sort of being the ghost in the machine of a material, of a, of a material body that, that, you know, that the mind is just sort of something that happened along the way. Hmm. That's really interesting. We're, we're getting off in the ether, I think a little bit here. <laughs> yeah. For someone, we, we touched a little bit on the protein question and I know you've, you've written or helped uh, Dr. Garth Davis with proteinaholic and you helped Dr. Campbell with the low carb fraud. I know that that's a question that comes up over and over again. Do we want to, are you able to give us like a little bit of, um, the Coles notes version on why low carb is a fraud and why people's, um, why people think that we need so much protein when that's not necessarily true. Mm. Coles notes, that's Canadian, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is it, uh, that, does that not get used in the U S no, I think we, I think we, we say cliff notes, cliff notes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to make sure we're, we're talking about the same. We are. <laughs> um, so the, there's really interesting data on certain people who are low carb, who eat a low carb diet, and they seem to be doing very, very well, which, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of disheartening because you'd want to, you'd want everyone who goes low carb to immediately like, you know, flame out and, and just prove the point. So there is, there's something very interesting that happens at the extremes of diet, um, which I can't, ex I can't explain. I don't understand. It's also true that low carb is, when you compare it to the standard American diet, much better in, in the things that it eliminates. So the, the issue, though, where, where the fraud comes in is, is really it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding of the importance of evolution. So, so here, here's the story. The, and, the, and low carb, you know, it's, it's best incarnation in terms of story, I would say, is paleo. Is it some, yeah. some version of paleo. And so the paleo story is so compelling. It's, it's kind of like the fight club view <laughs> of, of, of history. It's, it says that human beings have basically been domesticated and made sick by society. And if we want to understand how to be healthy, we need to go back to our evolutionary roots because we, our bodies haven't evolved. Yeah. So there's now this huge mismatch between our bodies and the environments, including the food we're eating. And I agree with that 100%. It's, it's, a, it's a great story, and it makes an awful lot of sense just on the surface. Yeah. The fraud comes in when people who don't know anything about anthropology, archaeology, evolutionary biology presume to tell us basically this this view of ancient humanity that's about as accurate as if you were just watching the Flintstones. <laughs> right, so, so when, when you look, when you look at the math, the amount of meat that we're supposed to eat on a paleo diet 
would have been the sort of the amount of meat that maybe a tribe would get once or twice or three times a hunting season. Hmm. You know, they'd had they that that basically hunting could not have provided stable a stable source of calories. Right? It's basically like saying, um, you know, my 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 plan, my financial plan is to play the lottery. Yeah. Right. So obviously if somebody wins the lottery, that's great. They got a whole, you know, windfall of cash. Yeah. But if that's their plan, they're going to die out. They're yeah. not going to have enough money because it's, 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 it's too fragile a system with, with too much uncertainty. So to think that, that a, a species like ours could have survived on a diet of, 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 of such randomness and uncertainty just, just boggles the imagination. Yeah. And, and when we look at hunter gatherer societies that, you know, have been recent enough to still exist or some that still exist, we see that the hunting occurs exactly when there is plentiful plant food because they have to be able to, you know, you don't, you don't go to, to Las Vegas or Atlantic city or to some casino Hopefully, when all you've got is the mortgage money, yeah, you know, you you go to spend your windfall. Like, oh, I got a couple thousand extra bucks. Let me go, let me go gamble it. Let me go play a game. Right? We take we take risks at the margins, not at the very center. So to to say that we need meat three times a day, we need large amounts of meat. It means that we're we're taking our system that was designed or if not designed then then capable of metabolizing that quantity of meat every so often and saying that that's that's what we're going to do to it every single day and it's it's it just it just makes no sense and then when you look of course at the effects of uh you know large consumption of large amounts of animal protein you you can see it playing out over time it may not it may not happen to everyone, and it may not happen quickly. Uh, but in terms of like, just like if if aliens came to Earth and looked around and didn't have a, any skin in the game and just said, "Well, what what is the human? What is the optimal human diet?" Like they would just go and look at the people who live the longest and kind of take a look and yeah. say, "Well, this is what they seem to be eating. This is how they seem to be eating it. This is the kind of communal structures they've created." So smart humans would go do more of that. <laughs> and it turns out that in every single case, those societies are, are largely starch-based with, you know, 7 to 10% of their calories from animal products and, you know, 70 to 90% of their calories from whole plant foods. Yeah, if you, if you look at, like, fossilized poop from the caveman era, the, the, the amount of fiber that's in someone's diet is significantly higher than what is even being eating on a eaten on a modern day paleo diet so it's it's totally true like when when can you risk going and spending two days hunting a deer well you can do that when you're certain that you have enough food should you fail and that's really where that that idea you're talking about is is you've got the windfall to spend Right. And so and so this paleo fantasy is, is being promoted by people who actually, you know, don't don't make paleo food at all. But they know that, you know, OK, so a small percentage of people are going to go out and do persistence hunting, you yeah. know, slather themselves in mud and go out with knives and bows and arrows. The rest of us are going to call ourselves paleo and just get, you know, Omaha steaks. Yeah. Right. Or, we're, you know, or worst comes to worst, we'll go, we'll, we'll go to Cheesecake Factory, order a giant burger and, and uh, you know, virtuously say, hold the bun. Yeah. Yeah. So w most people, when they when they say they're going paleo, they give up the refined uh, flours, which is a good thing. Um, what, what else would they give up in, in, in a modern day time? Yeah. I mean, when they go paleo? Yeah. It dep depends on the, uh, your cult leader. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> you might give up. You might give up um, beans and lentils. Uh, you know, various legumes because they're supposed to have a uh, an enzyme that's not good for you. Um, which no nobody told the uh, you know the, the longest living 
groups of people on earth for whom a cup of beans a day is standard fare. Yeah. Uh, so again, you have, you know, what we, we talked about both in whole and proteinaholic, this idea of cherry picking bits of data and, and, and holding on to that data in the face of obvious facts that contradict it. Hmm. So, you know, an example that we used in proteinaholic is that of imagine like a JPEG, a computer image of a blue sky. If you zoom in to the pixel level, not every pixel will be blue, right? To get that blue sky effect, you'll have all different colors. Yeah. And they're sort of, you know, melded together, however computers do it, to produce a generalized blue. But what, what a lot of um, market-driven research does is it, it goes in looking for an orange pixel. And when it finds an orange pixel, either, either an actual orange pixel or it does a bad study or it lies and then it announces an orange pixel, then they start saying, oh, that proves the sky is orange. Yeah. And, you know, we, we mere mortals who are just reading our Facebook feeds or listening to, you know, the, the 10 o'clock news or uh, reading Parade magazine and we hear about some new study that says, oh, well, you know, oh, I guess bacon's good for us now. We're like, well, these people don't know what they're talking about. We might as well just do what we want. Yeah. So the you know, so some people are are, are very anti beans. There's uh, anti dairy paleo people. There are uh, paleo people who are suspicious of any kind of of grain, um, whether whether it's um, refined or not. So I guess I guess overall, there's there's definitely good parts of their diet if they're excluding dairy, uh, but there's definitely um, negative aspects of eating so much meat as well. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I I think of myself as paleo, like I really I really live according to that philosophy of I want to I think my body needs the kind of nutrients and stressors and social structure that it grew up in. And when you, you know, when you think about it, like basically human beings are plant eaters. You can see it in our biology. Yeah. You can see it in our history. You can see it as human beings shift to plant eating in this day and age and their diseases all go away. And they, they get those plants by traditionally by gathering. So I think we are hunter gatherers. I think the hunting was a very, very small part of it. It was mostly to, you know, for sexual selection rather than natural selection. Hmm. And you know, we're supposed to we're like the guys go out and uh, and show off yeah. for, for mates. Uh, but basically, we're meant to move around a lot. We're not supposed to sit at desks. We're not supposed to sit in our McMansions and nuclear families, separated from the rest of of creation. We're supposed to move around a lot, collect plants, eat plants, and experience uh, on a regular but unpredictable basis environmental extremes like cold, heat, wind, you know, all, all those things basically represent the, the ancestral environment in which we developed and thrived. So you consider yourself paleo then. What does your diet look like? Um, well, so... Sometimes I have a lot of fruit. I mean, I, you know, sometimes um, I do potatoes, baked potatoes, brown rice. Um, basically, I eat plants in as close to their natural state as possible. Mm. And I try to sometimes not eat. Once, once or twice a week, I try to go a, a significant period of time without putting food into my body. How long would you fast at that time? Sometimes I'll just skip one meal. Occasionally, I'll go 24 or 36 hours. Okay. I haven't made a, a, a personal study of it, but I do, I do think that I, I personally get way too many calories. <laughs> and uh, I think that's probably true of most of us. We are definitely in an environment where there is a calorie surplus pretty much all the time, or at least it's available. Yep. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and we're just like I was talking about that, uh, that conflict between biology and an impulse. So I have a biological impulse when I see calories to want to consume them because who knows what will happen tomorrow. 
And since I don't live in an environment in which that kind of randomness and variability is enforced, I have to, I have to consciously override those impulses. Yeah. Cause like the squirrel, you will eat the nuts until you're, <laughs> until you're overflowing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So based on your research, um, is there a particular average for say protein needs then? Like what, what are, are people, is there variability in the population? Well, there, I think there's always variability in the population. Um, you know, we, we looked at that question kind of in depth and the answer we came up with, we, we, have, we have a calculator. Like if you go to proteinaholic.com slash calculator, you can kind of figure that out. But the, the reason we came up with all that was basically to reassure people that you are not protein deficient. Yeah. Right. So let's, let's look at the symptoms of protein deficiency and figure out if you have them. And we don't actually know what the symptoms of protein deficiency are because we never see it. <laughs> right. What we see, what we used to think was protein deficiency is actually generalized caloric deficiency. You know, okay. quashi orcor, um, could be ameliorated, not by giving them, you know, people who are suffering from a protein, but just calories, whether it's carbs, fat, sugar, doesn't matter. So we, we don't actually know what protein deficiency looks like, except in the, in the context of starvation, you know, any more than we know what, what oxygen deprivation looks like, except in the context of people being suffocated or drowned, right? Protein, I would argue that protein is our most important nutrient because it's the one least like the others. So if our, if our, our, three basic macronutrients of protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Carbohydrate and fat are very similar, and they can be turned into one another by the body. Hmm. Protein is really different. It's got all those nitrogens in it. It's just, it's just this wholly other thing. And it's, it's what we're made of. And so it's so important for us that we, we would not be here having this conversation if it weren't ridiculously easy to get. If there was any chance that a, an organism that was fulfilling its caloric needs wasn't getting enough protein, that species would have died out. Okay. I guess in that kind of concept, if we're made of it, it's very likely that other things that are alive are going to be made out of it as well. So regardless of what you're eating, you're going to be getting protein because we're all, we all follow the same basic formula of DNA to create life. Yeah, yeah, and the, you know the DNA and the RNA are basically right, like you know, little protein factories. That's I've never thought of it that way. That's a great way to think of it. I, I have heard before that, it, yeah, the only way to be deficient is to essentially be starving. Did your research touch on like why that myth is so prevalent in society? Is it? it did it really go back to people just trying to sell meat, trying to subsidize those industries, or? Um. We didn't really theorize that much. We kind of looked at sort of, you know, the, the, the 19th and 20th century history of protein. Um, I think a book that, that, does, that does that job, I don't think we were trying to do that job, but a book that does that job is Martin Zaraska's book, Meat Hooked. I don't know if you've seen that. No, I haven't, I haven't come across that one. It's a good book. And she talks about the psychology of meat eating and, and why, you know, she, she, one of the things I love is like, you know, you put meat on a barbecue and kind of everyone, pretty much everyone salivates at that, yeah. that smell and the sound and the, the taste of like, you know, crisping, slightly burnt meat. Like why, why would that be such a turn on for humans? And the theories that she's uh, um, come across is basically that that told human beings that they probably weren't going to die from the meat because it was cooked sufficiently to kill mm. all the pathogens. Okay, yeah. So that... it's, kind of, it's kind of perverse. It's very ironic, right, that this thing that makes us want meat so bad was basically a, an evolutionary accident that allowed people who, who preferred that smell of, of, of deep burning to not die from bacterial infection. <sighs> Well, yeah, from an evolutionary standpoint, um, there's no advantage to living a long, healthy life. There's only an evolutionary advantage to get old enough to pass on your genes and have those live to pass on more genes. 
Right. With one, with one exception. What's uh, that? Grandparents. With grandparents? Yeah. Especially grandmothers. That if, if, if women live longer, eat well past their, um, their reproductive life, then they can take, they can in, ensure uh, or improve the odds of survival of their grandchildren. Hmm. Yeah, because of the tribalism. Yes, yeah, they're helping out. Yeah. <laughs> remember, remember, we started this conversation with, with me being an insane parent. <laughs> you know, had, had we been tribal and there were grandparents who had been through it all and could have taken over, like, <laughs> you know, I would have, I would have, uh, I would have been a much happier, healthier parent. So I, we're, time has flown here. Usually I ask my guests uh, if they were to provide some advice or for someone that's on the fence or thinking about mending their own path, what, what advice would you give for someone that's either thinking about it or just starting or anything like that? Yeah. Well, you know, we can think about things until we die. And for me personally, there has been almost no change I've made in my life that ultimately ended up being better, smarter, more effective because I read another book. Hmm. You know, like we, we, a lot of people, myself included, we like to think a lot and we like to get lots of opinions and make sure we figured it all out before we start. And so, if you know, if someone is, is listening to this and they're like, yeah, I'm kind of on the fence about this, like nothing's going to get you off the fence. You know, you, 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 you turn off this podcast and you could listen to 30 podcasts by people who are going to tell you a great story about paleo, right? So, so if you're just looking for more information in order to make a decision, it probably ain't going to happen. What, what, how humans make decisions is by doing and seeing what happens. So if someone's thinking about it, like go, go sign up for a, for a challenge or, 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 you know, download three recipes or say, I'm going to take a week and and try something or even you know you don't have to go like go extreme but just say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna take a tectonic shift i'm gonna cut dairy out of my diet for a week I, you know people have profound improvements in their health when they get when they discover and get rid of all the dairy so i i would say do something and then you'll have actual information as opposed to other people's opinions that's great advice. And so some people may be looking for coaching and you provide that as well, don't you? I do. Thank you for asking. Um, I have a, a, basically, I got tired of trying to convince people about the diet. Like I spent so many years researching for, for these books. And then, you know, every time somebody had a new study that showed something different, they would send it to me and I would go spend hours you know, pouring through that study and looking to see if it had value or where, where it went wrong or why it differed. And I just got tired of it. Like that, that, it didn't interest me anymore. What really interested me was people who wanted to make this change and were failing. People who said, yeah, I, I read the China study or I read the starch solution or I read proteinaholic or, or I read my beef with meat and I, I believe it and I want to do it. And I'm still catching myself like, giving into cravings, mm. eating Ben and Jerry's in the middle of the night, going out to White Castle. Like, what's wrong with me? And it's those people for whom I have tremendous amount of compassion because that was me. And in my years as a business consultant, business coach, um, health scientist, I've, I've figured out some really powerful techniques for people to change their behaviors, to be in line with their values, their priorities, and their health goals. So that's what I do now. I have a program with uh, Josh Lajani, who I don't know if you, you know him. Or yeah, I do. Josh, is, his story is incredible as well. Yeah, from like 420 pounds down to um, you know, the cover of Runner's World in December. Uh, so he, you know, he's been my inspiration in a lot of ways. And we have a program together called the Big Change Program, where we take people who who really want to make a big change. And, you know, I don't know anyone who's made a bigger change than Josh hmm. and he and I guide them through it. And then I do private coaching and, uh, and offer, you know, classes, lower, lower cost classes, and then do a lot of, um, free stuff through, through my podcast and my blog. So where can people find you? They can find me at plantyourself.com, where I, uh, that's where I host the podcast. 
And the plot, you know, the plant yourself.com is really like the tail wagging the dog. Like that's all I was doing for years when I was not in the field. Now that I'm in the field, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to make it kind of a lead generator for the business hmm. that I want to do of, of helping people be well and improving the, their own lives and the planet and uh, the lives of animals. So you can also take a look at um, bigchangeprogram.com. Currently we're, we're closed, but we're, we're working on uh, rebooting with an open rolling admission so people can join at any time rather than having to uh, wait for a cohort. Okay. And if you want to email me, it's hj for Howard Jacobson at plantyourself.com. You let me know what you want to do, what you're struggling with, what you want to achieve, and we can figure out a way to get you the help you need. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Howard. It's been fantastic talking to you today. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Mendit Pass podcast at www.menditpass.com. Don't forget to check out the Mendit Pass resource page at www.menditpass.com forward slash resources. There you'll find many resources that can help you on your journey back to better. See you all next time. Visit Mendit Pass.com and get back to better.